everybody. Welcome to the New Market Alliance Church podcast, where you're invited to not just attend church or watch church, or in this case, listen to church, but actually go and be the church. For everything you need to know about our community, be sure to go to newmarketalliance.ca and maybe even drop us a line to let us know you're listening. We read everything you send and we'll be sure to get back to you. Our worship service happens every Sunday at 10 a.m. in person or streaming online. We want you to know you absolutely matter to God and you absolutely matter to us. Everyone is welcome and wanted. Now, let's join today's teaching been talking about actually putting on our marching boots, grabbing a spiritual weapon, and going to war with our real enemies. And you'll remember that our real enemies are not who we've been told they are because of maybe a lack of imagination, or more accurately, maybe because the spiritual eyes of people's hearts have not been opened to recognize that there is a an unseen battle going on around us. We've been told our enemy is found in people. And we, and we went through the list of folks that we assumed are the enemy. And it may change depending on what tribe you're part of or what church you go to or who you hang out with. Liberals, conservatives, Muslims, Buddhists, criminals, sexually promiscuous, abortionists, socialists, fascists, complementarians, egalitarians, hyper-Calvinists, Arminians. No. These people that we may disagree with, we may find annoying, we may, uh, we may even recognize they're under spiritual influence, but they are people created in the very image of God who need hope and they need salvation And it would be God's desire that none of them would perish, but have eternal life. But this third enemy may cause just all kinds of confusion, just in terms of definition. The devil, um, that's pretty clear, um, how he and his demons are our enemy. The flesh gets a little more complicated, but I think we intuitively understand when when Paul the Apostle says, dang, the things I don't want to do, I end up doing, and the things I uh, end up doing, I don't want to do, and that's the flesh, the opposite of the spirit. But the world, that's a little more confusing. And, And you've seen where some Christians have interpreted the world as anyone not in our tribe, right? That's the world. And those people are the enemy. But, but this is a word that's going to come up in different contexts, have different meanings depending on, you know, the original Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic, depending on the context. For instance, let's start with John 15, 18 to 20. If the world hates you, remember, it hated me first. This is Jesus talking. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you're no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than the master since they persecuted me naturally. They'll persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. Jesus is warning his followers. The world which crucified him may treat us very similarly. It's a a hostile relationship. But Jesus' intent was never for his apprentices to abdicate their responsibilities in the world or to the world. As much as there are parts of the monastic movement that I think are so cool, um, Jesus was no monk. Yeah, he went into the desert, but he, he always came back. That's, that's the template. So listen to some of Jesus' last words in a prayer to the Father uh, for his apprentices. He says, <clears throat> I have given them your word, Father, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. 
I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. So what exactly do these writers of the New Testament mean by the world? The word is cosmos. Uh, You may remember the character from Seinfeld that in Greek where we, we get, it's obviously where we get the English word cosmos. And, and similar to the Greek word for flesh, it has more than one meaning. And we're used to doing this all the time in English. Think of, think of the word racket. You know, there's the noun. I took my racket to pickleball. Where are my pickleball players at? Yeah, good. You're not embarrassed, eh? To, to, no, good. Um, <clears throat> or your dad... Your dad would come into Neil's room and say, as he's playing his Led Zeppelin records, turn that racket down. Or um, or a third meaning might be the police busted uh, Neil's (laughs) illegal (laughs) betting racket, right? We got three, three meanings there. In the same way, the Greek word cosmos has at least three meanings in the New Testament. Sometimes it just means the the universe, or more specifically, the planet Earth, like in Romans 1.20. For ever since the cosmos was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Is this an example of the world being our enemy? No, no. God made the cosmos and he said, it's very what? It's good, it's good. And in this context in Romans, it's like, it's like a theater to display God's power and divine nature. It's like daily proof of the reality of God, his love his creativity. But other times the word cosmos refers to humanity itself. You know, the mass of men and women and children that populate this planet. The most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, the cosmos, that he gave his only, that whoever believes in him will not, but have eternal life. In this context, is the world our enemy? No, far from it. In fact, it turns out the world, the cosmos, is our mission. The cosmos is to be an object of love, not disdain. But there's a third sense of the word cosmos. And it's a little more conceptual. It essentially means the systems and practices and standards associated with a godless society. The world in this context is a place where man reigns supreme, where man is autonomous and free and evolving into something stronger. God is either non-existent or unconcerned. It is, it is human initiative that makes history. It's where man can attain his own salvation. But the world is more than just no God. It's often actively anti-God, isn't it? This is what John meant when he wrote and what my friend Greg shouted into the mic. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, we talked about that last week, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Where where does Satan dwell again? In hell? No, actually, that's his destination. It's actually the world 
where is Satan's domain? It's, it's where Satan's authority and values reign. And because deception is his stock and trade, if you are of the world, then this all seems right and normal and good. It's sort of the logical result of our, our first two enemies. The world is where Satan works and lies. And the world is what happens when a lot of people give in to their sinful flesh so much so that it becomes normalized. It becomes systemic. As slavery is such an obvious example of something evil becoming a, a cultural norm. You know, more than just an individual bias or opinion or, or a racist person, it becomes woven into the fabric of the social, moral, legal, economic arenas of many countries. You know, most disgusting of all was it became even normalized, justified, advocated in, in many churches a couple hundred years ago. And it, and it starts off first by being practiced by a f- few, and then many. Then it's sort of accepted as a necessary evil. Uh, but then it's codified into law, or in the case of our American neighbors, into the Constitution. In time, it just becomes the way things are. Um, just, just to add a bit of balance to the discussion, I should also say it was predominantly Christians who fought to end slavery. And, and it must have been so discouraging, though, to be fighting often against other Christians who didn't see it as the evil it was. So that's the world uh, a system of ideas and values and morals, uh, social norms that are integrated into the mainstream and often eventually institutionalized into culture, um, corrupted, you know, by what the book of Judges in the Bible says. It's everyone doing right in their own eyes. I like how the message translation put it. People did whatever they felt like doing. That's the world. Does it sound a little 2024? The world is what happens when Adam and Eve's sin goes viral. Uh, The world is when the obscene becomes blasé. The world is when sin is redefined by a number of things. Uh, When you call sin freedom or human rights, or the way things are, or nature, or science, or boys will be boys, or locker room talk, or anything but sin. Malcolm Gladwell does some really interesting writing on how behaviors, both good and bad, spread through a network of of friends, family, geographic areas, very much like a virus. Uh, the classic example is, you know, of yawning. When somebody near you yawns, what do you do? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's unconsciously almost. It's a well-documented phenomenon, yet um, it's true not only of our physical behavior, yawning, shivering, smiling, but of our moral behavior as well. Smoking, not smoking, healthy eating, junk food, temperate drinking, alcoholism, civility, rudeness. Um, Pretty much any behavior you can think of has the potential to spread through a society, kind of person to person, family to family, area to area. It, it, it behaves remarkably like a, like a viral disease. It's a herd mentality that has literally been woven into our brains. You know, buffalo all walk on the same side of the field. Teenagers all wear the same sneakers. Uh, people in large cities tend to vote left. People in rural areas tend to vote right. It's, it's how often the devil's deceptive ideas 
can have such a strong hold on society for so long. If you, if you put these two concepts together, I want it and everybody's doing it, oof, those two justifications have great power. And, and even by themselves, but you put them together, man, they're almost irresistible. This is not a remotely new idea. But, you know, two millennia ago, Paul quoted what was likely already an ancient uh, proverb. And he says, good company, or sorry, bad company corrupts good character. Uh, we know that to be true. You don't need to be a follower of Jesus to believe this. It just, it simply is. We become like the relationships we cultivate and the culture to which we belong. In earlier times, it was, it was God and God alone who could define righteousness, beauty, goodness. And today... Those answers lie within us. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. If the customer is right, you know, is always right. If it feels good, do it. These are some of the main humanist credos. In the, <clears throat> in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, they're not just tolerated, they're actually, what? Celebrated. And, and I've noticed those who refuse to even celebrate are condemned. You know, Paul wrote about the meaning of this world, meaning, um, or sorry, wrote about the wisdom of this world. What the world thinks is smart, or clever, or even virtuous. And he says the wisdom of the world is foolishness in God's sight. Not saying there's no wisdom to be found outside of, of the Christian fear, sphere, but clearly there are some things that the world values, promotes, celebrates, platforms, that God has a radically different take on. You know, Isaiah the prophet said, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Again, I can only wonder at God's emotional response to the redefinition of good and evil in our society. You know, lust being redefined as love. Marriage being redefined not as a covenant of, of lifelong fidelity, but a contract you can nullify if your needs aren't getting met. Um, the objectification of women through porn redefined as, as female empowerment. Um, greed as responsibility to shareholders. Uh, environmental degradation redefined as, as progress. Political violence uh, redefined actually these days as spiritual warfare. Racism as a past issue that we have solved. And, and abortion as, as reproductive justice. And listen, we, we, owe, we owe it to have a much more nuanced, more compassionate, less vitriolic conversation about abortion. But the sheer nerve to use the word justice. You know, one Icelandic doctor recently said, we have basically eradicated Down syndrome from our society. Folks, what he meant was, we've killed all the babies with Down syndrome. And so in some circles, if you try to assert that all babies, regardless of their intellectual capacity, are worthy of love, and celebration, you might instantly be labeled as anti-progress, anti-woman. Let me say for the millionth time as we close this series, the people of the world are not our enemy. They are the object of Jesus' love. As Paul wrote, our struggle 
is not against flesh and blood, including people of differing religions or political perspectives. God so loved the people of this world that he gave his one and only son. Our fight is not against them. It is for them. Somebody say amen. And in, in, in this war, listen church, every follower of Jesus in every culture has to ask the question, in what ways have I been assimilated into the host culture? In what ways have I become just a little too comfortable with a system and a philosophy that looks nothing like the kingdom of God? Where have I drifted from my true God-given identity and eternal inheritance? Like, can, can we just be honest? The danger for us is less about you know, waking up one day and finding ourselves to be atheists. Even though there is a, there's a few high-profile examples of this. Our more clear and present danger is sort of, I don't know, drifting into this hybrid, this, this mix of Jesus plus consumerism, plus individualism, maybe, maybe slowly adapting the majority ethics of the world until we have a faith that doesn't resemble the gospel. It doesn't look like good news. And so tempting in this society because the worst instincts of our flesh are actually celebrated in the world. And it turns into sort of this self validating feedback loop where we're all telling each other what we want or what our flesh wants to hear. It's like when I ask my wife if she'd like me to get her some dessert. As any married couple knows, I'm not actually asking her if she wants dessert. I'm asking her to enable me to get dessert (laughs) guilt-free. If I trick my brain into thinking I'm eating dessert as an act of love to her, rather than just craving sugar, then I can justify my behavior. So she says, no, I'm good, and I still get my double portion of pralines and cream Kawartha ice cream. Folks, how do we resist? How do we fight against the real enemy of the world. This may sound really self-serving to some of you. You may be like, oh, of course a pastor would say that. But, but, But think of it. If the devil is the father of lies, we fight him with what? Truth. And if we are tempted to be in the flesh, we we choose to be led by what? The spirit, the opposite of the flesh. So the counter to the world is actually the church. Whether you think of church as a Sunday gathering in rows or a much smaller community meeting in circles in a living room or around a table or as I would suggest, you know, a mixture of both, we can't follow Jesus alone. Jesus did not have a disciple, singular. He had disciples, plural. And the call to follow Jesus was and still is a call to join his community. The community of the way as, it, as it's called in the book of Acts. And by following Jesus together, not alone, We are able to, in community, one, discern together uh, the truth, separate it from the devil's lies. Two, help one another override our flesh by the spirit. And three, form this robust community of deep relationships that function as a counterculture to the world. This is an idea that we've kind of lost, but I feel like we need to recapture in this generation. 
that the church can be a counterculture, a, a beautiful resistance, an alternative society. Knack is like a city within a city. I shouldn't just say Knack. I don't mean Knack. I mean Knack and Crosslands and Cedarview and Grace Church and Victory Baptist. Every faithful Christian is part of a city within a city, a remnant. There's that word again. A group on the margins of, of a hostile culture living a very different but compelling and beautiful way, a witness to others of what a kingdom of life looks like in a, in a culture of death. It, it's Jesus' vision of what he called a, a city on a hill and his call to, to let your light shine before others that they may see your good works. It's Peter's call for us to be exiles in a modern day Babylon, to, to live such good lives among the people. They'll be compelled by our lives. It's the church of Acts 2. It's the church of Revelation 3. It's the faithful church under the Third Reich in Germany. It's the, it's the house church movement in Mao's China. It's the Orthodox Christians in Syria today. It's increasingly you and me. There's a tremendous opportunity in our cultural moment for the church to come back to her roots as a true counterculture. Now, it means making peace with the fact that we are strangers in a strange land. If you ever feel like I will never fit in this world. It's because you never really were meant to, okay? This is not your home. If you ever feel like, I'm, I, I will never be cool. I will never be liked or respected or admired by the culture. Well, maybe you can just make your peace with that because perhaps you were never meant to be. The word church itself, ekklesia in Greece, in Greece, in Greek, means those who are called out. Not in a community of comfort, but in a community of calling. Okay? So when we um, talk about the practice of church, I'm not just talking about attendance on a Sunday morning in a, in a building. In my little benediction to go be the church, I hope you don't think I'm minimizing Sundays though. Uh, I'm all for Sundays more than ever because after dozens of hours of podcasts and Netflix and phone alerts coming in to our minds all week, we, we need an anchor of Sunday to, to reorient our minds to reorient on truth, um, to reorient our hearts back on God. And every time I walk in on a Sunday morning and I see you beautiful saints, you followers of Jesus, I remember, oh yeah, I'm not alone. I'm part of a royal priesthood of believers. As flawed and as quirky as we may be, so while the church is not less than Sunday morning, it's far more. It has to be more to survive in, a, in the pervasive influence of the world. It, it means being a form of, of pushback against the systems of the world. Because at the same time, um, we are deeply for the world, okay? We are for Newmarket. We are for York Region. We are for the people of this area. But we are against evil. Um, we're for joy. We are for thriving marriages and families. We're for children to be brought up in a, in a loving delight. Adults being set free from sinful enslavement. And, and I'll close with this. To become a church 
that our world actually needs. Two things. Number one, we need to become a community of deep relational ties in a culture of individualism and isolation. Deep, vulnerable relationships that stand in in sharp contrast to the superficiality and loneliness of our day. I think something closer to the honesty and intimacy of an Alcoholics Anonymous um, than the sort of superficiality uh, image management of social media. Think of the tearful confession of sin. Not small talk. Think of the trust within relationships that are formed over decades as opposed to chit-chat. This could look like a commitment to a small group. It could look like regular meetings with just two or three Christ followers um, where you get uncomfortably real with each other. It could just look like regular people around a meal, around a table, people who follow Jesus with you and hold you to that pursuit. Second thing is we need to be a community of holiness in a culture of hedonism. The word holy in Hebrew literally means set apart. So we are called out ones who have been set apart. It means unique or different. To live holy is to live differently from the world. Differently in how we spend our money, how we spend our time, how we steward power, how we talk, how we engage in social media. Like, think, quick to listen, slow to anger. How we do marriage, how we do family and sex and singleness. I'm sorry if I keep coming back to sexual purity, but one, I think it's one of the primary tests of our generation's fidelity to the way of Jesus or to the way of the world. Second, it's also one of the most common New Testament examples of non-Christian behavior. And, And thirdly, frankly, sexuality has always been an area where followers of Jesus stand in sharp contrast to the world. From the Acropolis in Athens to downtown Toronto. I'm going to wrap up here, but this is not some classic sermon on battening down the hatches and stocking up on our prepper supplies, okay? And, and living the Amish life of, you know, no outsiders allowed. What if this isn't about living in fear of the culture, thinking of them as a threat? What if what is happening right now is an opportunity for something new to be born? What if there's a a conspiracy of God in all of this? What if there is a growing discontent with the ways and the systems of the world and we're on the verge of a great turning back to the living God? People can't live without meaning and purpose and community. The world can't seem to offer that. Not all three. Jesus can. What if the church is coming back to her call as a community radiant with the love of God? What if these little pockets of revival that we see in campuses like Asbury start springing up all over including right here in Newmarket. Does anyone else feel like that could happen in our generation? Oof. Until then, though, we wake up in places tomorrow like Keswick, Aurora, Bradford, Holland Landing. We will try to love our neighbors as best we can. We'll carry the burdens of our city. We'll raise our children as best we can, 
the ways of Jesus. We'll pay our taxes. We'll obey the authorities that have been placed over us. We'll volunteer. And like the prophet Jeremiah said, we will work and pray for the peace and prosperity of the city where we've been called. And all the while, almost in a clandestine sort of way, we will put on our army boots and we'll grab some spiritual weapons and we will fight the devil and we will fight against our flesh and we'll fight against the world, at least the systems and the values of the world, while at the same time fighting for the world, for the people that Jesus loves, for the people that he came to suffer and die and set free. So we do this, all of this, not for our little club here, but for the sake of the world. We'll, we'll stand as brothers and sisters in a beautiful resistance. And if we live, we live for Christ. And if we die, we die for Christ. And whether we live or die, we belong to Christ and his family, and we will fight for the sake of the world. Amen? Amen.